about the type of uh, training and these Yamanaka factors? Is there a type of training that seems to influence them more than others? Sure. Let's, well, maybe we talk about Yamanaka factors just in a global sense before I address the exercise question. And I said before that, you know, the reason how we become a fully formed human being is through these changes in epigenetics. We start with these stem cells, which could almost become just about any type of cell. Um, and then these epigenetic changes happen as the cell progresses through its fate transition to become whatever it is it's going to be a muscle cell, a skin cell, what have you. Um, so this was, I guess, I want to say it was, I should know the year. I think it was 2006. I can probably Google it. Um, you know, uh, there it was discovered that you can take a differentiated cell. So let's just say a skin cell, for instance, and you can put it in a dish and overexpress these Yamanaka factors. And they're called Yamanaka factors because they were discovered by a guy named yeah. Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And it has really transformed the face of cell biology and entire industries are built around the idea that you can make stem cells out of differentiated cells because of Yamanaka factor. So essentially, let's say you take a, a, a skin cell, a dermal cell um, that had it's, you know, it's, it's fate is decided. It's, you know, a dermal skin cell, you put it into a dish and you overexpress these, these four factors and they're called the Yamanaka factors, which he discovered. So OCT3, 4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMAKE. He didn't discover each one of those individually, but he discovered all four of them together and the way they function. What it does it allows that fibroblast to turn back into a pluripotent stem cell, which can then go and become a bone cell or a muscle cell or any other number of things. And this really transformed cell biology. It was, you can take something that, you know, is older, right? You can take a skin cell that, you know, has has a defined trajectory and has a defined um, identity and basically turn it back into like the, the youngest form of itself, a stem cell that can then go and become something completely different. And so that was a huge discovery. And again, the entire industries have been built around this idea now. And the, this research has been expanded on tremendously since that discovery and since you won the Nobel Prize. Um, but to answer your question specifically, what Yamanaka factors – do they get turned on with exercise and muscle? Which ones? What type of exercise? So this is kind of the area that I've become more interested in in the last you know three or four years. And to answer the question, um, when you go exercise, all of these Yamanaka factors, what their basic function is, is to epigenetically reprogram. So kind of wipe the epigenetic slate clean, so to say. So the cell can then revert back to its earlier state, a stem cell state, um, is the best way I can describe it. And so, but these Yamanaka factors are transcription factors and they can go and basically turn on thousands of genes at the same time. Um, so they're very, very powerful. And that's part of the function of, of, or that's part of the reason why they're so powerful. So they can turn on a lot of genes and they can also kind of rewrite the epigenetic code, not the genetic code, the epigenetic code to, so that genes can be accessed in certain ways. And so when we go exercise and skeletal muscle, a lot of different genes get turned on, but um, transcription factors, which are what these Yamanaka factors are, um, they get turned on too. And the one that gets turned on the most with exercise is this one called MYC, which is, um, or CMYC, um, M-Y-C. And so we found that first of all, it goes up in muscle a lot with exercise. Second of all, it goes a lot up, it goes up a lot specifically with resistance exercise. Um, it does go up with endurance exercise as well, but um, it does increase um, in response to resistance exercise quite, quite largely to a pretty large extent, but it's not a big sustained increase. It's not like you do an individual or a bout of exercise and it stays elevated for 96 hours, you know, like it goes up. Maybe it peaks at three hours and starts coming back down and is back to baseline by like 24 hours or so. So it's kind of like this pulse and then it goes back down to baseline. And when this transcription factor, which is a Yamanaka factor uh, as well, when it gets turned on, it activates a whole bunch of different genes that we think are important for exercise adaptation. And so that's what we've become really interested in is trying to understand, well, what does this one Yamanaka factor do in response to exercise, specifically in response to resistance exercise? And can it be leveraged to make older muscle at least adapt more like a younger muscle? Um, because it has this role as a Yamanaka factor that can kind of make 
older cells appear younger again. And so that's kind of the area we become interested in. And so how would one determine that? Obviously, through muscle biopsies, I know that you've got mouse models, um, which you've done a wonderful job creating some uh, very exciting translation to humans. If an aging skeletal muscle becomes less effective, a decrease in power, you know, we know your research is showing that there's this Yamanaka factor, particularly MIC, that seems to be turned on with resistance training and may have somewhat of a, and I use this word cautiously, a regenerative effect. I don't know if that would be the appropriate terminology. Is there a certain dose? Is it training dependent? Do we know if an individual does, I don't know, 10 sets of squat, 10 uh, right. sets of squats at their, I don't know, again, make it up. Right. 10 rep, you know, whatever it is with a, a lighter amount of exercise. Is there any uniform influence that we could say everybody at a baseline level should be doing this to potentially, and I understand that to target a Yamanaka factor is not the same as targeting a, a blood glucose number, but is there some right. <laughs> influence that we could recommend or does that relate, um, you know, again, to this DNA methylation, which I want to talk about next? What what are we telling people and how can we think about that from a regenerative capacity and what does that even mean? Right. Uh, I mean, I, I get a lot of blowback sometimes from, you know, a lot of times the word rejuvenation is thrown around, trying to rejuvenate a cell and things of that nature. And what does that mean exactly? And it's, it's, it's a hard thing to pin down. I mean, I like to say that, you know, these muscle, when we induce these Yamanaka factors, we're kind of shifting them towards a state where they are, I guess, more plastic. So have a, a greater ability to adapt potentially. So um, as far as your, your question, because regeneration is a separate process. Mm. That is something I'm interested in, but it's a, a stem cells has to do with a lot with stem cells and things like that. And that's, that's a whole other conversation about regeneration um, with aging and all these things. Cause I spent six years studying muscle stem cells um, prior to this. And so I spent a good deal of time thinking about that. And so yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic unto itself, but we'll, we'll stick with the, the Yamanaka factors for here. Um, and so as far as like a dose of exercise that would in, induce MIC, for instance, at least from, I've never done the study, right? I've never done the study where I've taken somebody and, okay, we're going to do five sets versus 10 sets or, you know, three sets versus eight reps or what have you. I've never done that. I mean, that data might be somewhere out in the literature. Um, I'm not sure, but the, the people that have focused on Mick, Mick hasn't been super as focused on as, as a lot of other things, um, that are exercise responsive. So, um, you know, what I can say is from, you know, there was a study that was done a couple of years ago by one of my collaborators that they took all of the, the gene expression data from all of the exercise studies that have been published to date. So basically, it was this big compendium of studies where people had biopsies done before and after different forms of exercise. Um, and then they looked at all the genes that were being expressed in response to that exercise. So you can do this these big sequencing studies or these big microarray studies where you can basically look at all the genes, more or less in the genome, and which ones are being turned on or turned off in response to exercise and muscle. And so they, you know, there's been many of those studies done over the years. They took all of them together and did a huge meta-analysis and said, okay, these are all the studies to date, what genes are being turned off and on with exercise. And when I looked through that database, which is, you know, dozens of studies. Just a handful. Um, yeah, it was a bunch, a whole bunch of studies, and they did a great job of putting it all together and making it usable. There's a little website you can go to and plug in your favorite gene and see if it gets turned on with exercise and muscle. It's really cool. It's called Metamex, um, and it's uh, Julian Zirath and Nico Pilon in, in Sweden and Karolinska that, that put this together. Um, and so you can go in there, you can look at your favorite gene. Um, and when I did that, I found, well, that's how I, one of the ways I figured out that Mick was the one that was being expressed the most with exercise. And it seemed based on some of our data and um, some of, you know, the data that was in that, that, that big meta analysis that res just resistance exercise in general was better stimulus for Mick. Um, and we found that in our own studies too. We published a study where we did a time course of 
biopsies after resistance and endurance exercise. So we took a biopsy. I say we, my collaborator in Sweden did this. His name is Ferdinand. Um, I helped him with it, but this is his study. But he took a biopsy before and then took biopsy 30 minute, three hours, eight hours, and 24 hours after a resistance exercise bout and an endurance exercise bout. The resistance exercise, like I'm pretty sure it was like your typical three sets of 10 with like squats and leg extensions and things like that. And then their endurance exercise, I think was just maybe a 45 minute cycling bout, if I'm mm. not mistaken. Um, it was pretty standard. It wasn't anything fancy. And yeah, we found that Mick went way higher with the resistance versus the endurance. Now, to all of that is to say that I'm not answering your question directly because I don't know. Like, I don't know if one set or 10 sets is going to be better for inducing this response. But one thing I can say, and this is a word of caution, um, is that, you know, Mick sounds like a good thing, right? It's a Yamanaka factor. It may have quote unquote rejuvenating properties. And, you know, all these things are good, it sounds like. But in actuality, though, you know, Mick goes up after exercise and it comes back down. And if you were to leave it up, that would be bad because it's it's an oncogene <laughs> as well. And so Mick was one of the first genes implicated in in the cancer. progression of cancer. Yeah, exactly. And so that's not good. Um, so when it gets turned on chronically or gets turned on constitutively where it's always on, that's bad. And so it needs to be controlled in this way that's kind of pulsatile and more transient. Because if you just turned it on all the way and left it on, that would be really bad. Like that would be – your muscle doesn't really form cancer. It can, right. um, you know, but it's pretty resistant, the muscle fibers specifically. But um, but that would not be a good thing. In the same way that turning on like mTOR, for instance, you know, they call that the master regulator of muscle growth, mTOR. When you turn that on constitutively for like long periods of time, it actually results in um, pathology and muscle atrophy. Like it needs to be controlled. Um, and so because also mTOR is implicated in cancer as well. Yeah. And so and interestingly, as we get older, mTOR actually gets goes higher. Mm-hmm. 